Now, the minority in Parliament has served notice it will challenge the legitimacy of the passage of the Electronic Transactions Bill, a.k.a. e-levy. Parliament passed the controversial bill Tuesday after the consideration stage was completed by a majority side house. Now, the minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, had earlier accused the majority of smuggling it into the order paper. According to him, the e-levy was not captured in the business statement for this week and questioned why the majority would pull a surprise on the NDC. Despite their appeal for time to study the report, the Speaker proceeded to hear the debate before the bill was approved. Parliamentary correspondent Quincy Parker-Wilson now reports. After three months of struggle, town hall meetings, engaging stakeholders, fisticuffs in the chamber, a one-sided majority side has finally approved the e-levy. First, the finance minister was in the chamber to move a motion. But this, according to the minority leadership, uh, was in one way or the other smuggling the levy into today's order paper because it was not captured in the business statement for this week. Electronic transfer levy bill 2021. Why? When you presented business statement, it was not part of the business which was approved for the House. We have time and again warned and cautioned that we never want to be taken by surprise on a major economic policy bill of government. We have always insisted, Mr. Speaker, you can go to the answer every other Friday. We have said that never take us by surprise because, Mr. Speaker, Parliament cannot be when I conveniently have my numbers, then business can go on. It cannot be. And we will not accept that culture. Let them be sure that we are ready for them. We will debate you and we will vote against it. We will support it. We are ready for you. In spite of the accusation, the Speaker paved way for the motion to be moved. I beg to move that the electronic transfer levy bill be now read a second time. Now, whilst the majority leader was expected to conclude the debate, the minority actually staged a walkout. I'll, I'll disappoint you because I'm concluding, Mr. Speaker. I know that you are time man. So, what is So, Mr. Speaker. This side, we don't support e -living. We will not support e -living. Count us out of it. They can proceed with whatever business they want to do. I thank you, sir. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Put the pressure. 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 My colleagues are in the chamber. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues are in the chamber. I invite you to put the question now. Put the question now. They are in the chamber. And so I proceed to put the question. Those in favor of the adoption of the report of the committee in support of the second reading of the Electronic Transaction Levy Bill 2021, say aye. Those against, say no. Honourable members, the eyes have it. The Speaker of the House, apart from the fact that the minority has staged a walkout, indicated to the House that indeed they still have the required numbers to proceed with the consideration of the motion. When you keep on giving surprises to the Speaker, the Speaker will also be giving you surprises. But these surprises to the speaker sometimes are overwhelming. 
And so we need to continue to make sure that we process the bill. I have no problem with us going on with the consideration because the House is properly constituted. You know, workout doesn't stop the House from proceeding with his business. And so um, my pleasure is for us to continue and we'll move to the consideration stage of the bill. The majority side were excited over the approval of the levy, insisting that this levy would definitely go a long way to help cushion the Ghanaian economy. If we have to do revenue mobilization in, inside the country, what it means is that we will curtail the rate of borrowing and thereby curtail the increasing debt stock. Who in Ghana, which MP, will say that he doesn't like this? So colleagues, I believe we are adding them on these matters. Now, what Parliament ought to be looking at is reportage. How much is coming? How are we applying those revenues? And I think that Parliament's oversight responsibility should come into play. But the minority held the press conference and alleged that what was done in the chamber is illegal. I'm voting with at least half of all the members of parliament present. During second reading, you did not have half of members of parliament present. During the consideration stage, you did not have half of members of parliament present, per the Supreme Court ruling. And during the third reading, you did not have during third reading, you did not have half of the members of parliament, more than half of the members of parliament present and voting. Therefore, those of you who are celebrating with them that e levy have been passed and accordingly passed, your excitement will be short-lived. Immediately after this press briefing, we intend to file to question the legitimacy of the decision of less than one half of members of parliament taking a decision to approve e levy as second reading following our workout and at third reading, which is required, that a bill be subjected to third reading. The supposed e levy bill was subjected to a third reading with less than one half of the members of parliament present and voting. A charade as I have described it. So we are very convinced that there is no e levy and is working on nothing because we are keeping the videos and the recordings as we left and you don't expect to build something on nothing and expect it to stand. Well, that's it for the news. Uh, we'll be right back with some more sporting action, and then we'll get into our big stories for today. Stay with us on the AM Show. crowd here in Kumasi greets Ghana and Nigeria these uh, historic West African rivals going head-to-head -head in this decisive playoff tie only one of them will make it to the World Cup at the end of this year in Qatar Jordan Ayew on that left flank powering forward Truste Kong coming across to cover Felix Afenajian in the middle Ayew's ball in collected by Uzo. Their neighbours to the east. Brought down by Isahaku. Comes inside onto his left foot. The shot is blocked. 
Mohamed Kudus playing in that attacking midfield role in support of Felix Afinajian. It's laid back by him. There's the shot. A thunderous effort from Isaku. Turned behind by Francis Uzoho. It's the clearest chance we've had yet. Triste Con finding himself. Manuel Dennis, uh, of course, wasn't there either for uh, the Super Eagles. Comes out to party, hits it well, it's gone in, it's gone in under the goalkeeper. And Thomas Party gives Ghana the lead here. A stunned silence descends on the stadium in Abuja because the Black Stars have that precious away goal. And it's Thomas Party who gets it. He's already proven in this qualifying campaign that he can do real damage shooting from distance. That time, well, maybe it's a shot that should have been saved by the goalkeeper. It went right through Uzo. And it's first blood to Ghana. An absolute nightmare for the Ammonia Nicosia goalkeeper. Short and uh, very poor first touch by Etibo. Completely taking the sting out of that uh, set piece opportunity. Dennis. Truste Kong flighting it up towards the edge of the box, headed away by Idrisu Baba. Calvin Bassi. New look uh, left flank for the home team this evening with Calvin Bassi and Adimola Lukman both uh, starting for the first time for the Super Eagles. Here is Lukman. Down he goes. Big appeals for a penalty for the Nigerian supporters. The referee was right there. He's not interested. It's still alive though. Lukman playing it in, looking for Onyeka. Still alive for Nigeria. Saved by the goalkeeper. We'll take a close look. I remember there was uh, a penalty decision that was overturned by the VAR in the first leg in Kumasi. Nigerians thought they had a penalty then, it wasn't given. This is the incident here. Adimola Lukman has the ball. Daniel Amarty on one side, it's Dennis Odoi who comes in from the other side and appears to catch the Nigerian player does he play the ball it is a very difficult call for the referee it is a very big call indeed it's a penalty Nigeria have the spot kick and a chance to get themselves back on level terms on the night. Goodness me, well, Ghana's uh, World Cup qualifying campaign has been a story of penalties in some respects. They stand to attention. Down in the Nigerian technical area. A massive moment in this game, in this tie, and for Nigeria's World Cup hopes. Truste Kong from the spot, confidently dispatched. Wolokot went the other way. And the skipper makes it 1 1. And Nigeria right back in this. Difficult to break down, they've worked ever so hard. It's not a team with many superstars in it, especially when you take Andre Ayu out. But uh, maybe the one superstar, Thomas Partey, did uh, show up tonight with that early goal, which left Nigeria up against it from the off. Aussie men's header down, no takers, the five minutes of stoppage time have come and gone. And Ghana have done it. Ghana have qualified for the World Cup. 
They have beaten their West African rivals, Nigeria, on away goals. After a tense second leg here in Abuja, which matched the tension of the first leg. We had the goals tonight. Thomas Partey's early opener had Ghana in the driving seat from the 11th minute. And although Nigeria quickly got themselves back on level terms on the night with the penalty from William Trustecon, they couldn't get the second goal they needed. They never really looked like getting the second goal in the second half. And it's the small band of Ghanaian supporters here in Abuja tonight who are celebrating despair for the Nigerians. They will not be there in Qatar after appearing at six and a half. And that was how the cookie crumbled, the black stars of Ghana making us proud, all of us as a country, making us forget momentarily, if you like, the economic woes and the suffering that we've been complaining about. The black stars did it for us at the Moshud Abiola Stadium in Abuja. Some concern, though, about the scenes we saw in the aftermath, uh, people pouring onto the pitch and all of that. Of course, the Nigerian players distraught uh, yesterday on the back of that draw, which means that Ghana has booked its ticket to Qatar 2022 later in the year. We are not alone. Neighbours, Senegal, have made it as well. Uh, Cameroon in Central Africa has made it. Tunisia and Morocco as well, adding to the numbers as we head for the Mundial. Now, joining me for a discussion, you know, yesterday we had an interaction with uh, members of our team, Joy Sports editor, George Addo Jr., together with Muftao Nabila Abdullahi. All of them in Nigeria, they're still there. We'll have an interaction with them, uh, gauge what happened there, the mood, the Ghanaians, and what exactly the prospects are moving forward. They'll give us their assessment of the team's performance uh, yesterday. We also have coach Nana Ajiman, who'll be joining us. And uh, yes, in fact, I can see him there. Narajaman had a lot to say about the Black Stars ahead of uh, this qualifier. I'll be asking him um, what his take is now on the Black Stars after this performance. But let me start with uh, saying uh, greetings to all of you. It's still a good morning to all of you because I know one is in Ghana and the other two are in Nigeria. George Muftal Narajaman, good morning to you. Thank you for connecting. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ben. Thanks Great. for having us. All right, so Muftal Nabila Abdullah Nana Ajman, I want you to join me to do something very important. Today happens to be the birthday of George Addo Jr. So I want you to join me as we sing a happy birthday song to him. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you, George. Happy birthday to you. Uh, happy birthday, happy birthday. The sound voice is good. Happy birthday to you. Hip, hip, hip. Hooray. <laughs> Many cheers to you, George. Hey, 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 hey. It's a key uh, birthday for you. I guess a very fitting uh, birthday present uh, that, you know, His Excellency the President's birthday yesterday, but for you, it's today. Fitting birthday present. Yeah, yeah, very, very. I mean, I, I spoke to Coach Otoado and, and he says, me, I did it for you. I, I mean, Ket told me yesterday that we're going to qualify. It's going to be my birthday present. And, and I was, and I predicted a 1-1 draw and it happened. And, and yesterday we're on cloud nine. You know what? When, when, I, when I got into the Black Stars Hotel, they said, George, eat. I, I didn't feel like eating for about two hours. I only started feeling hungry, perhaps at 1 a.m. <laughs> so it's a fantastic feeling. Um, to know that the Black Star has qualified for the World Cup and, and it's such a special time in our careers uh, to get to cover the Black Stars at the World Cup. We love this. Right. A, a quick one back to you, uh, George. You predicted this yesterday. You said we would have a draw, but it would be a scoring draw, which would mean that whether it was 1-1, 2-2, 3-3, one, two, two, three, three, whatever it was, we would qualify. Do you feel justified? I mean, how did you feel <laughs> sitting there when the first goal went in from Thomas Partey and then shortly afterwards... Uh, we had the penalty decision. How, how did you feel? Yeah, you know, I, I even went ahead to say it was going to be a 1-1 one -one draw because I thought that we, don't, we, we didn't have too many goals in our side. And I didn't see us scoring more than two goals. I mean, more than a goal uh, in Nigeria. So, if you look at the subplot of the game, it was one in which Nigeria had to come out and really make their fans happy by scoring. But that was going to fall into the hands of the Black Stars. So the Black Stars getting the first goal for me, I was like, wow, 
This means that they have been dealt a psychological blow. They know they have to score two goals. The penalty, I'm not so convinced. I'm, I don't know what Nana Ajman will say about that, but I was not so convinced about the penalty. But anyway, once they had that, the second half was pretty flat for Nigeria, and Ghana was able to handle them. So I was very excited about it. Um, the manner in which the Nigerians wanted to you know, get around Ghana, but they were not able to do so. And, and we managed to qualify, you know, there to uh, the World Cup. So it was, for me, it was very, very important, but it was a, a result that I thought was most likely with the way that both sides had set up on the day. Right. Uh, just to let you know, uh, there are congratulatory messages pouring in for you on our social media. Facebook, uh, Kwame Jesus, happy birthday, George. Molai Skari, happy birthday, George. Uh, Wakao Wajesti, happy birthday, brother. So you're being celebrated uh, today you're trending, uh, George Ado Jr. But let me quickly come to... <laughs> I know you're enjoying it. Uh, bask, bask in the sun while you still can. <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let me come to an Anajaman coach. Uh, uh, so we have George Ado Jr. saying that, for him, that was a bit of a soft penalty. He didn't think it was a penalty. Do you agree? Uh, it was a soft penalty, but a penalty nonetheless. I think right. Pittman had the in a good area, he was shielding it very well with his body, and basically there was it was like as if there was a tap on his boot from Dennis Odoi, and that was sufficient enough for him to go down, and, and it looks like a clutter. And um, you've got to understand where we were. We're in Nigeria, even though we had VAR. Once the referee was directed to take another look, it was almost going to be uh, certain that the referee would call for a penalty. There you see it there. He is in between the ball and the defender. You know, you've just rewinded it there. He's coming forward now, and he's got the edge on him. And so uh, Dennis Odoi comes in on him on the right-hand side, and, and he goes down. I think you've got to give it. The referee didn't give it at the time, but that's the reason why we've got VAR. Uh, I've got no problems with it because it didn't change anything. So it, it, neither here nor there now. And so it's a decision that the coach could have gone either way and he decided to go the way of a penalty and he was right. He was spot on then. Yeah, I think, uh, it, it, you know, VAR said it was a penalty and it was a penalty it was. Um, it didn't make any difference because, as uh, George has said, psychologically the blow had been dealt and the Nigerians knew that they couldn't sit back and defend on a 1-1. They had to come out and play and, and if we were able to contain them, you know, it's, it was going to be over. What do you make generally of the performance of uh, the Black Stars yesterday? And as you give your verdict, uh, yes, they've qualified. But how much of an improvement has it been uh, from AFCON to now? You, you had some choice words for the Black Stars in the past, and I'll get to some of what you said. But uh, how different is their performance People have criticized the likes of Jordan Ayew, the likes of Jojo, uh, Wallacott, but, but it appears they, they are proving themselves, their metal. How do you assess uh, the team? Well, I think it was a very, very much improved uh, performance, and I give a lot of credit to the technical team because they've only had about 72 hours with these boys on the pitch. Granted, they may, be in, they may have been sharing WhatsApp messages in the run-up to all of this, but with just 72 hours... The first match, I was very impressed at Kumasi. I was impressed. Obviously, we couldn't score any goals, and that is where the main weakness of the Stars were. But to be honest with you, the performance they put up to, to hold Nigeria, to maintain that draw, was very good. You go over to Lagos, where they haven't got a, a, a dog's chance, a cat's chance in hell of winning this match, of qualifying. 60,000 in the stadium. We know it's going to be seriously hostile. The Nigerians are coming out to play, but we still did it. The early goal was a major blow to them. Psychologically, that was a major blow and it was a major boost to the Black Stars. And I think over two matches, the, the improvement from CK, from Milo, from Kwasiakia, very, 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 very significant. Very significant. Right. Very That's significant. Uh, let, let me just ask you this quickly. You say it's very significant, but last month, sometime last month, when you were asked about uh, whom you, you would prefer to lead the team, you didn't want Otto Addo. You wanted Chris Hewton uh, for, for uh, different reasons. And you fe felt that even with qualifying for the World Cup, we didn't need to as a country. But here we are. 
in uh, the state we find ourselves, economically speaking, and fuel prices and exchange rate, this has brought some joy to Ghanaians. So do you feel now that Otoado, looking at assessing his work, is the right man for the team? Yes, I would say that, yes. Uh, and he's not alone. Um, the Chris Hewton, who I wanted to head the team, he's still there. He's still there as part of the backroom staff. He's providing technical advice. You've got George Boateng, who has a wealth of experience, also providing technical advice. And you've got Didi Dramani there as well. And I believe all of them should be there. I believe they should be given some serious uh, contract now from two to three years, and they should be given the support. The environment should be an enabling environment that allows them to proceed in the way that they have started because they've brought on some new players and I know there are going to be other new players coming on board and it's totally turned, turned the team around in a way that one could not imagine. Um, so I believe that they should be there. I believe Otto is the right man for the job. Don't worry about me. I love humble pie because eating this humble pie today, when my PA comes in, she's going to be working on tickets to Qatar. So don't worry about me. I absolutely adore humble pie. Wonderful, wonderful trait of yours, the Nigerman. I'm proud of you there. But let me come now to Muftal Nabila Abdullah. You've been patiently waiting. We discussed this yesterday. What would be yep. your assessment of the Black Stars' performance? Who were your top players or those who shown the most yesterday for you from the Black Stars team? Ben, I think you've asked me a very difficult question. <laughs> top, top, top players in this contest. First, I'll go for the goalkeeper. Right. I think Jojo Wellington, who has received loads of flack from exactly. sections of the Guardian media and supporters, right. has always shown that he's an animal when it comes to being in between the sticks for the Black Stars. He pulled up some of the most incredible saves in this contest. Mm -hmm. To be an offside. One he saved with his legs. Mm -hmm. There was another one he saved when not at that ball. I think he was a man between Ghana and Nigeria getting a goal. Right. And that goal that provided the, the shield for the Black Stars and stopped them from conceding. At, at, at a point, moved out. At, at a point, we all had our hearts in our mouths because I mean, you think this one is definitely going in, and then one of them pulls pulls a save. Ben. This is already a goalkeeper, Ben. Many of us have got questions about, and for him to always step up and pull out some of the saves that he does, they are quite incredible. In Kumasi, when the Super Eagles were there, they had one big chance. He was the man who was between Ghana and Nigeria getting the winner. And he stopped them from getting that winner in Kumasi. And then the team was in Abuja on Tuesday night. He stepped up, put us on the most incredible saves. Alexander, I think big, big credit to the Black Star. He's part of the, the Black Star. And he fires last drop of his blood. Daniel Amate, what an incredible leader we've got at the heart of that Black Star. And Dennis Odoi. Comes in, making his debut, fitting into the team as if he was a part of this setup. Gideon Mesa, what a player. Then there was Thomas Party. I will always give credit to Felix Afinajan for his ability to press, for his ability to run at the opponents, making it very difficult for them to attack you. Kudus Mohammed did not give his all. Yesterday, I was having a discussion with George and the junior, and I mentioned that. In my interaction with some people close to the technical team, they said they needed just 60% of Thomas Partey's ability and Ghana would be walking away with the tickets to Qatar. And indeed, when Thomas Partey showed up early in this contest, he found the back of the net. And that's what he's always done. In most of the games that he's captained them in Kumasi. And Thomas Partey, what a leader he is. Then, Kudus Mohamed, he did not give up his bed, but I think Mohamed was was great, it was great, great in this contest. Then you are talking about Elisha. This is a player who was making his debut in this game. And when Otuado decided that he was going to pull that Baba Idrisu and switch to a 3-4, uh, 3-6-1 formation, Elisha was an animal in the heart of that midfield. He was the man who was passing the balls more forward for this Black Stars team. 
He was a man who was more of a shield. He could hold on onto the ball. He could release the ball. What a player he was. He was making his debut in the Black Zone. And guess what? They dropped him in the middle of the seat. A contest that was supposed to see Ghana qualify to the FIFA World Cup. And Elisha showed up. Then there was Andy Yedo who came on in the second half. Right. What a big Andy Yadom. Yesterday, right, Andy Yadom. It was great. So, very, so, so very basically, great. Muftao, you're saying that it was a team performance. Yes, we had some standout performances. It was, it was um, a collective team performance. And right. guess what? Guess what, Ben? Tell me. When Jordan Abu was taken out, many of us would notice that in that area, they were able to attack us more. They were able to attack the Black Stars more by going to the corner ends and crossing. Right. In the presence of Jordan Ayu, he was covering grasses more for this team, making it very difficult for the Super Eagles to attack. I, but I think, in his I think, absence, I, I, I think Muftao, that one thing people have not noticed is that Jordan has ceased being your typical number nine, a, a crucial striker. He's a winger, basically. He can play both roles very efficiently. And when he's and, playing, and he may not score, but, but he will create opportunities for others to score. Ben, Otto will tell you that football goes beyond just the numbers. On that friends, when he was addressing the media, we appreciate the numbers. But football goes beyond the numbers. And that's where he said, if anyone wants to criticize Jordan and you, the person should first criticize him because he decides who plays and who does not play. Exactly. He decides how many minutes Jordan and you should play. And guess what? When I met him at the Black Stars Hotel and they were preparing to leave, he said, I told him, Otto, you have made history. The first coach to be part of the first ever Black Stars team that made it to the FIFA World Cup in 2006. You've led Ghana to the FIFA World Cup. And he told me, Muftar, we did this together. This is a man who gives credit to even people who did not kick football. And that clearly tells you that he's one man who rallies everyone around him. And you asked um, Nanajiman a question. Is Otto Ado the right man to lead the Black Stars? Quite difficult for anyone to speak now because in 180 minutes, he has shown that he can turn around lost interest in many of us. They, they have become prima donnas who, who lack the of a player for everyone to throw his weight behind. Right, right. But in this context, Otto Ado has shown that he can turn the fortunes of Ghana around. He can turn the fortunes of Black Stars around. And just leave it on a funny note. All you right. can even turn the fortunes of the city around. <laughs> and speaking of the CD, just because you bring that in uh, in here, that he could even turn the uh, the fortunes of the CD around. There's a comment coming in on Facebook from one Fiamale who says, Akaku, I beg, uh, stop saying this brought some joy to Ghanaians. Have the fuel prices reduced after the stars <laughs> won uh, last night? But of course, we, we <laughs> shall rejoice. <laughs> yeah, we shall rejoice because this is Ghana, Nigeria. And also because we've qualified for the World Cup. It's a yeah. national yeah. affair. But let me come to you, George. Do you feel <clears throat> that Georgia Wallacott, with these performances, has justified the fact that he should be number one between the sticks for the Black Stars? Well, I think he has made a case for, yeah, being in the post for the Black Stars for a few more games. Uh, there's one thing that's clear with Coach, Coach Otuado and the technical team. They continue to tweak. So you have to defend your space. You have to prove that you are the guy always. You have to continue to show improvement. The good thing about this team as well is that everybody in the team has got something to work on. And I'm sure the second quality will be doing that. I think that uh, Judge Bolokot has done so well over the, the two legs we've played. He's been improving gradually. He's been getting into the groove. So at the moment, as we speak, it stands that Jojo Wallacott is definitely the man uh, to be in the post for us. And it's amazing because we have changed coaches and coaches. I mean, from Sika Kono to Milovan and then to um, Otoado. And they all kept on keeping Jojo Wallacott in, in the post. That, that meant that they were clearly seeing something that uh, we were not seeing. There, there have been a few jitters, a few mistakes that he has made. But I think that he's proving that he's one that we can work on. He's one that can grow up to become the, I mean, what, the best goalkeeper, you know, for the country, the man that we are going to rely on. At this point, excellent work that he has done. Clearly going forward, the technical team, very sure, 
have 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 had a plan. This technical team is so hands on. I mean, I like the way they they had separated all the pieces of this game. They knew what to do in the first twenty minutes. They knew what to do. Uh, in the George, that's where a consortium of coaches. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. They, they knew they knew what to do at every point in time, and so I know that they have. And and you could see even on the bench, uh, and Ajman will tell you that for the first time I could see that roles are defined. I don't see everybody coming up and screaming and shouting at the boys. Right. Everybody was doing something on the bench. Someone holding a beer and everything. So I think that indeed, look, Jolo Walcott has made a very good case uh, to get some more Black Stars games going forward and big Black Stars games. Right. Uh, do you concur? Do you agree, <clears throat> Nanajaman, that um, <clears throat> Jojo Walcott has justified his his spot as number one? And, and I want you, just, just briefly on that, then I want you to tell me, while we have qualified, which was the ultimate aim, what were the sticking points from yesterday's match? What are some of the things that the Black Stars ought to look at? What things did not go well yesterday? Yeah, well, first of all, when Jojo Walcott was selected, um, I was all for it. There was an issue about the level of football he was playing in the United Kingdom. And, and I had a lot of rows with uh, other football enthusiasts. Because, because who, he plays for Swindon Town. Some felt yeah. not, not, not the English Premiership or something. So why are we picking him? Precisely. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, in every way, the English Football League is much better than the Ghana Premiership, the Ghana Premier League. That's, there's hands down. There's, there's no doubt. The standard of play, the infrastructure, everything is much better. So I was confident when he came from day one that this is the guy who we should have him there. Um, I think he's more than justified his position. Um, he is the number one goalkeeper. No problems about that. Now, going forward, the issues that we've got to deal with, most certainly it's about goal scoring. That is the main issue that we have to deal the with. The striking it's department. About, yes, it's about goal scoring. And... Um, I'm grateful that we've got seven months in which to deal with it. I believe that every FIFA-friendly uh, uh, day that is allocated, uh, those opportunities must be taken. It can't be as we did before when we had a FIFA-friendly day and then we would say, oh, the Black Stars don't have anyone to play. This cannot happen this time around because we need the squad to be uh, gathered together as, as, as often as can possibly be. Because if, if just with three days, this technical team has created a winsome team, a winsome side, can you imagine what will happen over a seven month period? I could see potentially that after seven months, the Ghana Black Stars could be a team that could well breach the quarterfinals and be in the semifinals of the World Cup. So, first and foremost, it's got to be goal scoring. I think with a lot of the new players who are in, the Kudos, the Kamandines uh, and the likes, um, we, we, we have to work on their decision-making. Um, we, we have to teach them to be aware of their colleagues around them, to be aware of the opposition around them, when in possession and when not in possession. In particular, when in position, what they should do with the ball. Should they move the ball on or mm. should they do the trick? Because I think that quite a few of them get caught up in exhibiting their skills. And they're quite skillful. But sometimes they exhibit the skills at a time when really they should have moved the ball on. And sometimes they move the ball on when they're in the ideal position to exhibit the skills, hold the ball and perhaps try a shot or push a through ball. So, so, so that's, that's, that's more of the technical angle, right? That's more of a technical play, which Chris Hewton should be focusing on. So that's, that's a lot more work for him. Yeah, of course, of course. But it's right. good work. Wonderful work. And I think their biggest headache will be who is going to be in the final 25-man squad. Because you've had some players who were injured who weren't able to come up. Semenyo, for example. He's a striker of Bristol City. We see what he can do. We need to give strikers the opportunity. I believe, as it stands at the moment, form is important. We have Brighter J, who plays for Ediana Stars. He's got about 12 or 13 goals. Let's have a look at him. Let's see if he is the type of rough diamond that we can brush up and polish over the next period. 
I think we must still keep an eye on local players because I think potentially there's one, two or even three that could join up with this squad. So I, I'm not worried about defence. So, so, so quickly, quickly, Nanajiban, you say one, two or three of them could. That is the local players. If you had the yeah. opportunity, if you were coach, which ones would you be eyeing? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you that now. I wouldn't tell you that now because there's quite a number of them and we're talking about specific positions. What I would say is, is that the likes of Tori Lamptey uh, of Brighton, we need to talk back to him. Even Mohamed Salisu, who has uh, rejected our calls severally, we need to go back to him. It doesn't matter if now his motivation is we've qualified. It doesn't matter. If the technical team believe that he can contribute to our success in the World Cup, then he should he should be involved. Um, and you know we've got to have two we've got to have two players for each position. We must because seven months is a long time, and there will be injuries and lots of different issues that will pop up between now and the World Cup itself. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I hope that the Ghana Football Association and the government alike will combine to create an enabling environment for our technical team to work in. They will provide the resources and the support that is required so that whatever this technical team designs as the plan, the way forward to prepare the team for the World Cup, there will be nothing that will hinder uh, and come in a hindrance in okay. their way. Right. Let, let, let me, Muftar, I'll come to you sh shortly, but let me, let me go back to George uh, briefly. George, so what are the, the problematic areas that, while we've won, we should be considering when it comes to the Black Stars? And do you also agree, as Nanajaman talks about the fact that we must broaden our net and look at other players? Uh, former captain of the Black Stars, Asamwajan, has said that Majid Ashimeru should be in the team. He was surprised he wasn't. What is your take on that? Do you feel it is apt now for us to invite the, the likes of Majid uh, into the Black Stars? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's open. We have to get them to Ghana. So, and, and keep in mind, some players were injured as well uh, coming into these uh, World Cup playoffs. So I think we will still have to go and do the search. We'll still have to look for players. You, you need option A, option B, even if you can get opportunity option C, yes, you go for it, um, based on the way the coach wants to play. So I, I will be interested in finding out which players can make it and, and then fight uh, great players. Yes. Uh, the next thing I'll say about what we need, I think that in the final phase, in the third phase, I mean, in the final phase of our attack, we need to sort that out. I think that we have been able to organized a bit in defense and in midfield but you look at how the midfield is connected with the attack we've got a few problems there and it, and we have to raise a team that can score goals because it's obviously important a team that can score two goals a team that can score three goals that's important for me at the moment we don't have too many goals uh, in our team and that's why i looked back and said that look um we 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 were not going to score two goals. I felt that we would score a goal, and then if we were able to organize well, we will be able to run away with the qualification. So these are the areas that we have to um, um, work on. We have some great talents like Afenachan, you know, Osman Bukhari. These are all great guys, but we need to develop a proper system up front to make sure that we can get the goals uh, to free them, and then we can get the goals. That that's one of the things for me. And then of course in midfield. Clearly, more. I mean, roles have to be defined. Uh, who is who is breaking up play? Who is carrying the ball? Who is progressing the ball? Is important at the moment. I think it's at the back. Uh, really solid. We have the left back and right back. I'm sure there'll still be more shouts for players to come in. And, and then you, you look at the midfield. Uh, quite a lot of work to do. Like Nana said, seven months is a lot of time, and we have to work ourselves into a lot of friendlies to make sure that this team is ready. Okay. Uh, uh, before I go to uh, uh, Muftao, uh, two messages. Nana Kwame Redu says, at the moment, Wallacott is the best option and we should develop him. Let's not treat him like we did Kwarase. You remember? Kwarase joined us and uh, it, it didn't end so well. Uh, he also says, Nana Jaman, that is, he's addressing you, coach. He says, let's not be fooled. This team hasn't won a game. They drew both games, so please don't say it's a winsome team. If you have a reaction, hold on to it. Uh, when I get back to you, you can uh, share that reaction. But Muftal, so looking at the team's performance so far, what are the gray areas, the trouble spots that we ought to be looking at to get ourselves you know, ready for the Mundial in Qatar? First of all, I 
on the players. What I would say is that Ghana Football Association should be clear on who leads the Black Stars after tomorrow. Because the agreement with Otto Ado ends on March 31. And if the agreement with Otto Ado ends on March 31, are they extending the agreement with him? Because as we speak, I am pretty sure Otto Ado will be interested in leading the Black Stars to the FIFA World Cup. Though Borussia Dortmund wants him, they want to mold him to be the man who could be leading the team sometime to come. But Otto would say that it's a privilege to marry the Black Stars. It is a privilege to lead a national team he was part of in 2006. And if the GFA should have a clear commitment at 10 car team, that is good. In terms of players, George and Nana has all touched some of the incredible areas I think that and be, 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 before before you get there and, and hopefully you can be brief on that, but I just wanted to sneak in. So with with renewing the contract of um, coach Otto Addo, if we are to go by Mr. President's interactions with him, and of course the president of the land is not the president of the GFA, and I know the the the, the dynamics in there because they, there shouldn't be too much interference, but uh, we had Mr. President congratulate him and even suggest that uh, he should be careful because when he comes into Ghana, would kidnap him and not allow him to go back to Dortmund. <laughs> Isn't that suggestive of the fact that it's it's already you know signed, sealed, and delivered? He's going to be the man. It is not signed, sealed, and delivered because if people are to stand by their words based on what transpired in fact, I think that uh, he takes the job. Right. Friday, or yeah, effective Friday. That will be first January. January. That would be April 1, effective. So if people have to stand by their words, but things can change. At this point, a GFA president can go to the office of the president and tell him, I told you I needed Otoado. Otoado is here. He has qualified Ghana to the World Cup. I want Otoado to, to continue. That can be a sticking point for a GFA president to argue why he thinks Otoado is the right man. But there's also the other angle. Will people be willing to stand by their words that they had made between January 28th and February 6th when Chris Hilton was in Ghana? Because a couple of meetings were, were held. Chris Hilton had a meeting at Julian House. He had about three hours meeting with the Minister of Youth and Sports. He had about two hours meeting with the GFA President, Kato Kriku. He was in touch with him on phone. Most did them... Almost every weekend, he was flying from Germany to the UK. He was with Chris Hilton before he flew to Roma to meet Felix Afinadam. So it's quite difficult for one to sit here and say that the conversation the president had with Otoado is like a signed and sealed agreement. And let me just add one thing. Um, though not too directly involved here, when they reached an agreement with Otoado, they said that they were going to give him half the money they were giving to Milovan Riva. That's fifteen thousand dollars. For the two matches, they are giving him thirty thousand dollars. In Borussia Dortmund, this is a man who earns close to sixty thousand euros or more. So, how much is enough to pay Otuado? Well, by the conversation we've we picked up so far, Chris Hutton is willing to take something like eighty thousand dollars as head coach of the Black Stars, but. If they want to give the, the job to this is a job, we say that security. Otoado for now is earning the appraisals of M. But should the Black Star start flopping, you are now demanding for his credit, claiming how inexperienced he is, because we've always claimed that we want people who are very experienced. And another M, Nanajima here will tell you that coaches, when you're going to hire a coach, you go for the experienced hand who has done it over and over again. Otoado has proven that even newbies can get it done. He has qualified down to the World Cup, but it's pretty, pretty difficult for uh, Otoado to continue as head coach of, of, of the Black Stars. I'm not sure what would happen because many things can change. I'm sure when they were in the flight back to Ghana, many conversations might have transpired. Right. But I think that 
at this point, is going to be very, very difficult. On the players that I was just talking about, the left back position has always been an area of question. I think and, 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 and Mr. Al, Mr. you'd have to be very brief, very, very brief with that one. Go ahead. So, so, did that surgery? I don't know the kind of surgery he was talking about. That the team needed some mental surgery. I don't know if Otuado has done that mental surgery to this team to see them qualify to the FIFA World Cup in the space of 180 minutes of football. I clearly think that many personnel will come in, but whatever happens between now and November, where there's likely to be the availability of Callum Personal Doyle, Tariq Lamptey, Mohamed Salisu, because a contingent has been put together to meet his parents. And I think that whatever happens between now and October, November, we are probably going to have so many changes to this Black Stars team. A surgery again in certain departments of the team, I think, is a possibility. Uh, do this. I, I want two of you to address two different things, and that's how we'll wrap the conversation. Uh, Muftar, when I come to you after Nanajaman, I would have you uh, react to this bit about the scenes we saw. Uh, people pouring onto the pitch, uh, Nigerians, and the, the, the sort of things that happened. There was a Nigerian player who nearly attacked one member of our technical uh, team. I would have you react to that. And then, Nana Jaman, uh, if you look at, just to extend the conversation, because we know Cameroon, Senegal, Tunisia, and Morocco are joining us. Now, in the Egypt-Senegal tie, we saw the use of lasers, even while the, the, uh, the Egyptians were playing penalties and all of that. Is it acceptable? Should there be sanctions? Uh, some say that was why Salah, uh, Mo Salah missed his penalty. What would be your take on that, briefly? And then, Muftal, you take the other question. Well, lasers have been in the game for a long time. We've had this going on for some time, and we've not been able to stamp it out of the game entirely. Um, no, 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 no. Even the Egyptians cannot complain. They did it together in 2013 during the World Cup qualifiers. So why are they complaining? Yeah, but I'm not speaking about whether or not Mo missed his penalty because of that. I'm just saying in general terms, this is something that is very difficult to stamp out in the game because I don't know what those gadgets look like, but I think they're probably some slim light torch. They fit into the pocket uh, very easily. And, you know, you just can't, you just can't legislate against it. I think, but unfortunately, Na Nanajaman, if, if, if you, if you can hear me, well, we, we, we apparently have lost uh, Nanajaman. Uh, he was making an important point there. I think he, the thrust of it was that uh, we've not been able to do much about it, and maybe he doesn't know how much we can do about it uh, from the FIFA standpoint. But quickly with you, uh, Muftau, so the crowd pouring onto the pitch, uh, that yes. is not acceptable. Do, do these actions come with sanctions? And, I mean, this is where people get beaten and all of that. How did that happen? And then just to give you some... Sad news, a cop official apparently died after the supporters had attacked the, the, uh, the field. Um, apparently he was beaten, he fell, they choked on him, he, he was unconscious, just at Ghana's dressing room, just in front of him. And, it, it, um, is, this, is this the Dr. Kabungo person? Not too clear, his identity is yet to be, to be made to add understand that he couldn't make it despite attempt to resuscitate him at the ambulance. We, it's, it's quite unfortunate news to hear this morning. The, I, I cannot understand how the security allowed the fans to break through the, the gates and came onto the pitch to attack. They destroyed the goalposts. They destroyed the substitute benches. They were chasing the players to beat them. They were even standing outside waiting for the players to beat them. The Black Stars team had to be held hostage for more than one hour. The, both teams were not able to come for a post-match press conference because of security concerns. And these were some of the things that you wouldn't like to see in the, in the game of football because this is sport that people come out to have fun. But when emotions go sky high, it becomes very difficult to control. And these are some of the things that are not pretty in the game of football. Calf would definitely sound Losing uh, would be a big, big point that this the, the Nigerian Football Association or Federation and take the decision 
I, I missed your, your, your connection is patchy. Did you say CAF would definitely sanction Nigeria? Definitely, CAF would sanction Nigeria because they invaded the pitch. If you allow spectators to invade the pitch, uh, some of these things are always going to happen. Muftar Nabila Abdullah, uh, thank you so much uh, for staying with us. And um, we, we would gladly welcome you back. Just stay safe. Uh, George Addo Jr. also joined us. May I actually say, uh, uh, let me just tell you a quick one. We had a Nigerian colleague, Oluwa Shina. He came to where the Ghanaian journalists were. Myself, George Addo Jr., Fence, Daniel Cranfin, um, Eric Asidu Boedi, uh, Alex Robinus too. So he took us, he took the Ghanaian journalists to a certain point. He told us, be calm, nothing will happen to you. So just stay there. He asked the we sat down there for a couple of minutes. I, uh, then he came and said, let's go to the conference. Even where we were, he advised us, jubilating, just be quiet, just sit down. Whatever someone does, just keep quiet. And we had to. So we sat down there quietly, waiting for whatever was going to happen. But when Clapton, he said he was going to have the people who were, who were threatening us arrested. And that was more of a surety for us. And we sat down there calmly. And I'll, I'll give credit to Olu, Olu Ashina. He's a great, great colleague. He works for the BBC. We know him so well. And um, he was more of our security guy at the stadium right. when all these messy things were happening. Right. Kudos to Olu Ashina uh, for that humane uh, treatment there. Thank you very much, Muftar Nabila Abdullahi. George Addo Jr., editor with our Joy Sports team, uh, joined us as well. Nanajaman. Uh, Coach, thank you so much for connecting with us. All right. Now, uh, right before we get into the next segment and take AM business, we have for you the team arriving in Ghana. They did not stay in Nigeria. They made it uh, to Ghana. Here are some visuals.
Let's continue now as we get into our big stories for today. We're going to be discoursing solely on the SONA. Well, focusing on the SONA and matters related to it, like the e-levy, uh, which yesterday was passed. Or was it? We'll be hearing uh, from the different uh, people we've put together. Stalwarts, Dr. Theo Champo will join us at a point. Uh, Franklin Kujo of Imani Africa. Dr. Joseph Obenguta, President, Kujopoku Energy Analyst. Um, uh, Dr. Kwame Assas, anti-political scientist, and Senor Hossi, uh, CEO Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. All of them join us for this all-important conversation. And let me say good morning to all of you uh, who are here with us. Good morning. Good morning. 
Kojopoku, can you hear me? Good morning to you. All right, so Kojopoku is trying to uh, get with us. Hi, I'm here. Good morning. How are you? I am very well, Kojo. How about you? I'm very well. I'm surviving. All right. You will be going so. Uh, what what is what did you say? Yeah, the volume is very low. I don't know whether it's from my end or from your end. Is it is it better now? Can you hear me, Kojo? Is it better? The volume is low. Okay, so we'll work on the volume. Uh, stay with us, Kojo. We'll work on the volume. But I see Dr. Asasanti. I see uh, Dr. Joseph Obeng as well. Uh, Guta. President, Let, let's start on this note, even before we get into the Sona and matters arising. Uh, your quick reaction to the Black Stars qualifying for the World Cup in Qatar. Dr. Obing, uh, for you, I'll start with you in less than a minute. Yeah, uh, we, we thank God um, that they have qualified. Right. Um, they need to do even more um, so that we can showcase ourselves in the World Cup stage. It, it's a very good um, advert uh, advertisement for a nation. So um, it's all good for us. Uh, Dr. Asante? I'm happy, and I'm sure the nation is also happy. But there's more that we need to do. Now that we've qualified, we need to put our acts together because nobody gave us a dog chance to win this match. So we ourselves, we're not confident of our team. We need to put in the best and then get to Qatar and show the way. Uh, for you, Kojo, uh, I see, I, I hope uh, the sound is better now. Your quick reaction to the Black Stars qualifying for uh, Qatar 2022. Kojo Poku, can you hear me? Yes, the volume is much better now. Thank you. Great. So, so I'm saying your quick reaction to the Black Stars qualifying for the Mundial in Qatar. Well, um, we thank God. Um, we are going to be there. We are going to be uh, supporting the boys to make sure that they do well. For me, you know, every World Cup, every World Cup that we've gone to has come with its problems. Um, the concentration should be on the football. We should leave out the other item 13s that comes after every time we go to the World Cup. I'm hoping that we will put a lot more emphasis on training and good preparation for the boys. In, um, and GFA should really stop that thing where they, they now bring on unnecessary expenditures that now bring this whole thing into disarray. But it's a good ball. We, we didn't play as well that we thought we would have. It was okay. For the last 30 minutes of the match, the boys, I don't know whether they were defending or tired, but I hope, I mean, we can do better when we get to Qatar. All right. A uh, quick one from Dr. Theo Champon as well, right before we get into the nitty gritty. The Black Stars have qualified. How happy are you? What are you looking forward to? Uh, uh, good morning. It's a fantastic feeling, and I think it's great to see them uh, qualify. Uh, we do have some months now to put the team um, in shape, so to do more uh, training. Um, but uh, the point also being that the boys who qualified, uh, we should try and get them to um, get to Qatar. I mean, there shouldn't be any attempt to go and bring in other people who necessarily didn't partake in the qualification. There shouldn't be any monkey they work by when they chop business um, uh, in, that, in that regard. But overall, fantastic, fantastic performance. All right. Let's get into the SONA, the State of the Nation Address. We thought it would have been delivered a long time ago. It's taken quite a while. It's been postponed twice if memory serves, but better late than never to comply with Article 67 of the 1992 Constitution. Dr. Theo Champo, uh, I want your quick reaction to the, the measures as proposed by the Finance Minister to shore up our economy, even before we get into what happened yesterday, the passage of the e-levy bill, and whether in fact uh, it has been passed is another story. But the economic reforms as proposed by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata, your quick take even as we prepare for the sooner today i i think it's in the right ballpark um there's a, the measures that have been um introduced and there are four or five uh, broad themes on them there's the revenue side of the equation there's the expenditure measures as well and then there's also the uh, measures to deal with the cd depreciation um trying to pump in two billion dollars into the 
uh, into the economy. But fundamentally, as you see, the finance minister in the statement recognizes that we are facing mm -hmm. um, economic difficulties. And he lists about five um, issues, rising fuel prices, rising cost of living, exchange rate depreciation, um, rising interest rates, and then also revenue mobilization challenges. Um, and in that regard, the measures that were announced attempt to deal with a, a number of these, uh, particularly on the expenditure side of the equation where we've seen further announcement of cuts to uh, you know, expen expenditures, including the ministers taking a 30% you know, pay cut for the, the rest of the year. And I, I think it's rightly in the, in the, in the right um, ballpark and it sends a good signal um, about what they intend to do to resuscitate or safeguard the economy. When you look at the 15 peswa decrement when it comes to uh, prices at the pump, when increments have been up to about five CDs over a period of months, does that suffice? Uh, the likes of Guta and others have said, you're killing I, our I, business, I, the importers and exporters. What, what is your reaction to that? How, is it, how do you feel I, that is I, going I to hurt the ordinary Ghanaian? The, the, the 15p reduction actually is relatively negligible. I worked out the numbers. It works out to a 2% reduction of petrol prices at the pumps. So it doesn't really make much of a big uh, impact on consumers uh, at the pump. But the other fact also remains that the government is facing revenue uh, mobilization issues and they need to raise some uh, revenues from somewhere. I had argued in the past that there are other tax elements on the price buildup of petrol that we could have uh, reduced. But overall, that 15p reduction is relatively negligible. It's just about 2% of the total price that you pay at the, at the pump. Would you expect that if prices stay the way they are and uh, with some signs of positivity emanating from Ukraine and Russia after their meeting in Turkey, uh, would you propose that government do more? maybe on the tax buildup or otherwise to reduce fuel prices even more? So it's not even just a question of the crude oil price on the international market. The two other things that we need to consider is also the exchange rate or the CD dollar um, uh, uh, um, uh, amount. And we, that has had significant depreciation in the uh, past couple of weeks. So those two factors still all need to be at play in order for the government to be able to substantially reduce prices at the pump. So if the city stays stable and we do see oil prices going down as a result of, you know, the reduction of the tensions from Russia, Ukraine and, and things like that, then all things being equal, you should expect some further reduction at the, at the pump. But at this stage, I don't think we're going to see uh, a much bigger reduction than we anticipate just because the CD is still fairly not stable within the um, uh, Forex market. Hold for me, Doc, uh, Dr. Echampo. Let, let me come to um, uh, Dr. Asasante, Kwame Asasante, and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, I would like to find out from you uh, yesterday, and I'll, I'll start from the e-levy. You have followed the proceedings in the Supreme Court and the ruling that was uh, delivered uh, you know, in, in respect of some of Parliament's standing orders. Now it has come to the fore because the minority caucus in Parliament walked out yesterday. And then the majority end went ahead to vote. The, the, the key question, though, has to do with the numbers, whether there was a quarret, you know, number in there, the 138, because they did not have that, but the majority side uh, says the e-levy has been passed. If we are to go by the Supreme Court's ruling and what we know from the standing orders of Parliament, has the e-levy bill been passed from where you sit? Very difficult question because uh, yesterday uh, we're listening to uh, the goings on in Parliament and uh, there were this, uh, as we were, um, some aberration in the uh, processes because one would have thought that they would, you know, respect the rule and uh, kept it intact. But we saw a different thing. The good news is that the NDC want to test it in the court and see whether something will come out. Let's wait and see what comes out 
of the process, and then we'll take it from there. But, but is it not clear? I mean, I, I felt that on the back of the Supreme Court's ruling, it would delineate some matters, like we saw in the respect of the, uh, what constitutes a quorum, uh, whether the deputy speakers can vote and all of that. Uh, was it not clear enough? Sh should we still be doing this? I mean, it it's pretty clear, isn't it? That's why I'm saying um, I was disappointed because, you know, the rules are clear and the Supreme Court ruling was extremely clear on these matters. So, so why is it that Parliament took the position that they did? So the best way are to also go to court and see whether uh, they can make amends and then we'll move forward from there. What would it mean if the Supreme Court directs that that was illegitimate what happened yesterday? It means they have to go back and all of that. What would, me, what, what, what would it mean for governance generally, but for parliamentary business specifically? And I pose that question because people have spoken about being candid, doing the right thing, being honorable and all of that. Do you feel this is going to make uh, the, the engagement in parliament between the majority and the minority even worse? Already, the atmosphere in Parliament is polarized, um, partly due to the, the nature of Parliament we have here. And then um, events that follow, especially with the introduction of E-Levy Bill, which uh, they did not consult. I'm talking about majority did not consult so much that it created all manner of what uh, problems for Parliament. If that is going to be the ruling of the Supreme Court, then I'm afraid we have no choice than to respect the ruling and build the institution as strong as possible to stand the test of time. Uh, democracy, if you want to strengthen its frontiers, you must adhere to the rules of the game. So I don't see why you be in a hurry or you want to bend the rules to suit a certain particular interest. You said a bad president and you worsen the political system. Is that what you feel happened yesterday? Why is the NDC trying to go to court? They were not satisfied with the process. And they thought that there were some aberrations that need to be corrected. So that is it. If it turns out that the Supreme Court says this was legitimate, so yes, the e-levy has indeed been passed, what would be your expectations? Mind you, some Ghanaians have said it's not about paying, it's about what we'll get from all of this. If uh, the Supreme Court's ruling uh, determines that, well, it's good to go. What would be your expectations as a citizen and reflecting what you've heard from ordinary Ghanaians? If that is going to be the position of the Supreme Court, then uh, one, government must sit and sit properly because, you see, I'm not an economist, but people with knowledge in this area have said that, yes, if you want to go on that tangent, the best thing should have been 0.5% in terms of the percentage of tax up to 1%. Once you move beyond that, then the, you are going to create difficulty in terms of what means of livelihood and how we survive it, right? That is obviously going to come. But government should not be oblivious of this because it had its own effects on how uh, people perceive the government and how they vote 2024. We put in government so that they would do the needful to make life better. So if a government policy trying to worsen our situation, we advise ourselves when we are going to vote. There is that uh, danger ahead, which they should do well to manage. Also, you realize that people were, you know, not happy about this e-levy, simply because they think that some of these resources are not put into good use. I believe that uh, the government has learned a lot from uh, their activities when they were engaging people around the country and they pick some of this information. We have to sit down, make sure that the money that will be derived from these process will put to good use so that at the end of the day, transparency and accountability will be what? The real standard uh, that we use to measure the government. It is in the interest of the government to do that and then improve a lot of people. Uh, tied to this is what the issue of the economy. They need to set up and work the economy, uh, the economic mathematics very well because we are in difficult times. Let us remember that one of the factors that influence voter choices in this country is the issue of the economy. Irrespective of one's political tradition, party that you belong, everybody will want to have a booming economy so that they can also find a means of livelihood. This must occupy their attention 
and must work at it so that you will bring a sigh of real relief to the other man on the street. Otherwise, when we get to what elections, people are not going to spare the government. Two quick things, uh, but before I ask about what you're expecting ahead of today's SONA, what you want to hear as Mr. President speaks about the socioeconomic fabric of our country, I'd just like to find out very quickly, how do you feel about the minority uh, caucus walking out uh, in Parliament yesterday? It appears this is becoming a trend. How do you feel about the walkout? They say it was strategic, but what does this bode for us, politically speaking? I'm not worried when... Uh, a group in parliament stage a walkout is part of the parliamentary processes that you want to drum home some of your issues but when it become one too many then it calls for what reflection and then you take a different step but for me there's nothing wrong that if you are not satisfied with the process you don't want to be part of it let us remember that these things remain the books and the standard of the test of time so if you think a decision of government is not in line with your thoughts and your aspiration. You have every right to walk out and register your protest for people to know. Your expectations ahead of today's SONA. SONA Ebo, SONA Ebo, it's finally here. What are you hoping to hear from Mr. President? I want Mr. President to come out with something that touches on the economy. You and I know it is clear without doubt that we are in difficult times and the economy is facing a lot of challenges. We expect that uh, the, statement, the statement that the government will give will reflect how we improve the economy and then make life what much you know easier for people to what, uh, go about their normal business. The issue of debt bedding is um, becoming an albatross around our neck. We expect that government will also touch on that, work things so that we can reduce uh, this uh, debt bedding, which is uh, becoming a problem for us and crippling all the uh, businesses and whatnot. We also expect something to be said in the area of what fuel prices and how best they can address the issue. They need to go to the drawing board. Uh, there are a lot of suggestions that experts have said. It is better to pick some of these things and then work it in such a way that the ordinary man will also will not feel the pinch too much. Uh, having said that, with regard to the economy, I want to zero in on politics, that we want to see that Parliament, as we move along, will not be that antagonistic, and they will all sit together to do parliamentary work. And this means that we must encourage consensus. Consensus is the magic word that they need to build Parliament that will deliver the public good, and we expect that at the president will touch on that. The issue of accountability, transparency, it's something that is also on the hearts of many in this country, that we want to see how far government want to react to issue of accountability. There are a number of issues that people have demanded answers from government and they have not received reasonable answers. We believe that going forward, the president must do well to touch on these issues and give us hope that at the end of the day, we will believe the system that it will deliver what we want in the area of accountability and transparency. If you look at transparency international reports, all right, uh, issue of you know corruption, uh, they are still rating us in a certain light. But let us remember that the closer you are to zero, your country is more corrupt. So we should um, make sure that these things are tackled head on so that they don't affect the beauty of the governance system. It must occupy the attention of the president and we want to hear something positive in this regard. We want to also see more effort at strengthening the security system of this country to make sure that our security men who protect us also get protection. And also we help them to deliver uh, the service that is required of them. Uh, we have in recent time, sometimes flashy points and all that. Government must do well to come up with something that will arrest the situation and create uh, an atmosphere of peace. Already we have peace in this country, but we want to what, maintain and consolidate this so that we can run the government system uh, very well. Of course, issue of COVID, the, the president has touched on in recent time. Uh, so maybe something 
a little can be said about it and we move on. But we want to also have the president touch on issue of Ukraine and Russia because the, the goings on in the, that country, Ukraine, has uh, a lot of implications for West African country, African country, and for Amata Ghana. Right. And we should not be oblivious of this fact and do well to touch on and then prepare ourselves for difficult times around if uh, the, the situation don't get better. Uh, we hope and pray that the sooner will be the one that will change the fortunes of this country and bring hope to everybody in this country. Right. My last point is that uh, I want the president to touch on issue of coup and uh, that we are seeing in West Africa and the fact that we must do everything possible to you know, prevent it in this country. I, am, I belong to that school of thought who support democracy through and through. That if you have a difficulty with a political system called democracy, the best way is to use the democratic process to deal with, but not through any military adventurism that will not bring anything to us. I am hopeful that the president will look at all these things and throw it to us so that we can reflect and government can also work, do well to put them into practice so that at the end of the day, everybody will be fine in this country. We're grateful you've taken the time to join us and share your thoughts ahead of the SONA. Uh, Dr. Kwame Asasanti, and we wish you the best of the day. Uh, political scientist, head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. Let me come now to uh, Dr. Thank Joseph you. Obing. And uh, I'll just ask uh, that you be patient with us. You bear with us, Dr. Theo Champong and uh, Mr. Kojo uh, Poku. Just bear with us. You'll, you'll get your bite. Uh, Dr. Obing, now, there are so many things to digest, even before we get uh, into the sooner proper. But the land borders have been reopened, and the e-levy has been passed. When you look at our economy, what are your quick reactions to these two? How will the e-levy, for example, impact your membership? How will uh, you know, the reopening of the land borders impact your membership? Let's start from there. Uh, you, may, you may have to unmute, uh, Dr. Obey. Oh, sorry. Good. Am I on? Yes, I can yeah. hear you now. Th thank you so much. Um, I think we have to get it straight that the people who are paying taxes are just so few in this country mm. that we have potential taxpayers of about 13 million and that's less than 5 million of us are paying the taxes that is required in this nation. And that anything that ensures tax expansion, we are for it. Otherwise, most of um, the taxes that we are being paid actively revolves around just about 1.2 million people, which does not occur well for the nation. Uh, where we pay these taxes for the rest of us to depend on it. So anything that ensures tax uh, expansion, uh, we are for it. Otherwise, um, the, the trading community is always surcharged with these things, pay, um, uh, duties being increased with time and all that. So that's why um, the, the passage of the e levy I'm comfortable with. See, um, if you think about the e-commerce, um, we rather put um, a pressure on government um, for e-commerce to be taxed. And we are very happy that now uh, government have listened to our pleas because then... I, I, um, are, you saying, are you saying, Dr. Obeng, that you actually yeah. started... You, you, this idea was your brainchild that you put it to government that tax e-commerce. Is that what you say? You propose this to no, government? I, 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 you have to differentiate the um, e-levy from e-commerce. Right. The e-commerce is, is the business that is being done on the internet and all that. And we thought that is um, coming to urge us out, the traditional businesses. You know, we have the uh, fixed address and that the stores and all that. And so the tax people can actually come on us and take this about. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, you know that the new norm of trading is shifting towards the e-commerce. And so for us to be paying the taxes for the e-commerce people not paying means that there's disparity. And that's why um, uh, we, we put um, um, a pressure or a petition to government that they also are made to pay so that there's some parity in the trading that the traditional people will not be aired out. So anything that will ensure that we all pay our bit. But as to whether 
what we are um, 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 giving to us to pay is affordable. It's what normally I've been saying, that taxes when they are affordable, the compliance level is high. So whatever we are doing, we also, we also have to uh, think about the rate or the levy, um, uh, the rate of the levy that we are made to pay. And then the, um, uh, we do not make a, a monster out of a levy that will deter people from paying their bit. So um, um, that's why I, I, I wouldn't say anything bad against the yield levy, and that. Um, so, it, so, it, so it, in, in, in other words, Doctor uh, Doctor Obey, you are in support of the e levy as it is, uh, pegged at one point five percent. Do you feel that is affordable, like you're saying, to the ordinary taxpayer? One point five percent. We have other countries in the sub region doing what? Zero point five percent, zero point two percent. In fact, in some countries, zero point two percent was proposed, and there was backlash. We are looking at 1.5%. From where you sit, is that affordable? Yeah. If you are uh, making, uh, you are bringing a tax, you have to make it such that the compliance level will be high. Okay, let's take for instance, now you are charging 1.5. So if it is not affordable for the people, then they are going to the, uh, the device a new ways of um, dodging this tax. And that's what and may not even occur well um, for, for the system that has been, um, that so many noise have been made around it. Because now you are giving people the option, though, um, after one million garnets, uh, uh, after one uh, uh, hundred garnets it is, um, then you pay the tax. So when people break the lot into one million, one million transfers, it means that you are not um, uh, going to get the tax that you need. It means that people are dodging it. Because they have a way. If they are transferring 300 garnet cities, they can uh, uh, break bulk and they do it 100, 100. If it, even it is uh, each day, they do it, they will do it and then they will dodge it. But uh, if the task is um, affordable and then um, um, negligible, people will pay without even. So, so the, question, the question, Dr. Obeying, uh, pointedly is is it affordable for you? Because, like I'm telling you, in other countries, right here in West Africa, it's been tried even at lower rates. People protested. Uh, transactions fell by about 50%. I mean, that could be our reality. Is it affordable for you from where you sit? Yeah, the affor affordable um, theory can be discussed. And you, you know that we have proposed to have a 0 0.5 before when the discussion started. So uh, affordable, uh, that's what I'm telling you. Affordable is very key um, for us, so for compliance and all that. So... Um, um, I, 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 the calculations that went in for them to insist on the 1.5 um, is, is better known to it. Maybe when we are arguing about the, uh, the implementation of the yield levy, we should have concentrated on the, the rate of the levy and dwell on, on that. That would have even helped us more. Yeah. So um, uh, for a person to make everybody pay his bit for that so that um, um, the concentration will not be loaded on the importing community, we are always looking for um, tax expansion, uh, expansion. And you have um, engaged me so many times where I've said that the tax net needs to be expanded. Even the, the, the road tax and the, the, the road uh, boot, the, the road tax that were eliminated, I was not even um, in favor of that. Because in any way, some drivers will also be captured into the net to pay these taxes. So anything at all that will um, innovative way that will bring people into the tax net is welcomed for for us, so that we do not load everything on imputation, the duties that we pay, and the rest. Yeah. My my final bit to you: the economy is crucial to you and to your members. What are you hoping to hear from the president today as he delivers the state? of the nation address. What are you hoping to hear? What would be your suggestions uh, if you don't hear some things? So what, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, uh, before I go there, uh, with the e levy, I also wa uh, want um, to engage with the Ghana Revenue Authority now that it's, it, it is passed, so that we eliminate uh, any semblance of double taxation uh, for people who trade in this um, uh, Momo system and all that. So there too, we will we'll, uh, talk with the Ghana Revenue um, Authority to make sure that um, the, there's no issue of double taxation. But for the um, general economy and then the SONA, as the president is going to talk, 
you know that most of the things have been already been discussed or uh, pronounced by the finance minister. The issues that um, um, goes with trading um, have been clearly explained to us in terms of tax expansion, um, the um, infusion or injection of two billion into the um, system. I think the uh, the president is going to reiterate on these issues, and we want um, government to. Um, 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 and make a clear pronouncement that will uh, bring confidence into the system so that we can ensure stability into um, our local currency. In fact, that has been the bane of businesses. It is it, stripping us off. And so um, whatever will ensure um, um, confidence or bring confidence into the system for people who are trading in the currency to stop so that um, we can have um, stability in the currency then it will help. That's why we, uh, we uh, was not in support of the Bank of Ghana when they revised the uh, the base rate based on the uh, policy rate. Inflationary, uh, yes, the, the policy rate um, uh, based on inflationary trends. What is the push factor for this inflation? The push factor is the instability or depreciation of the city. So what we we will have to um, focus and work on. Was, um, to ensure the stability of the city so that by itself will um, suppress um, inflation. But if you go and increase the base rate where we are already contending with high um, 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 uh, lending rates and all that, then you put an additional layer of burden on trading. And right. so that one, um, a, a government has to look at it, and then the sooner um, they, they reverse it, the better. And then right. we are talking about the um, the port, uh, the opening of the bodies. Um, and, 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 also, and very briefly, because of time, so that will have to be your final point. Yeah, uh, it's very important for us, and we are very happy about the opening because we have been complaining. Uh, because most of our um, members apply um, the, that route, that the cross-border trading activities, um, especially those of us who have a small capital, they trade in Togo, Nigeria, and all that. And so when even the borders were closed, they were going through unapproved routes at the uh, detriment of their own life and all that, because some of them's money were um, um, uh, robbed and all that. So having brought them into the mainstream um, to uh, do legitimate trading through the approved routes so that they will be well documented is very good for um, um, uh, those members. Um, Right, here. right. Dr. Abing, thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us this morning and sharing your thoughts. Uh, when thank you. the president uh, does deliver the sooner, we'll come back to you later on to find out what you make of it. Uh, let me now move on to Kwejo Poku, energy analyst. Uh, Dr. Echampo, thank you for holding. You'll get your next bite soon. Uh, Mr. Kwejo Poku, uh, the E levy has been passed, uh, so to speak, of course, is going to be taken up in uh, the apex court. But what is your take on uh, the rockers in Parliament yesterday on the back of the passage of the E-Level, uh, E-Levy? What do you think is the way forward to have some sort of coherence or understanding or consensus in Parliament on the back of it? Right. Um, good morning and good morning to your viewers. Um, I would have thought that the roadshow that was done, the town hall meeting, was to try and get consensus and input from the citizenry. And uh, there will be some input of the, um, the town hall meetings into the new bill that was going to be late. Um, I didn't know that uh, they were pushing ahead with the old bill that was already late and going into second read. So if you look at it, you realize that not a lot has been input or no fresh um, suggestions or anything. The only thing that is different from what was laid in parliament and amended is um, the 1.5 from 1.75 to 1.5 and insertion of some clauses to say that no third party would be brought on board to monitor um, or collect the e levy except GRA. Now, for me, a bill like the e levy should be consensual. It should have both parts of the floor because, look, how many years down the line do we think that we are going to go before the minority also comes into power and probably now say that, look, we are going to campaign on the fact that when we come, we are going to abolish e -Levy. We don't want a situation where 
something as crucial as revenue generation is going to be um, a do or don't matter at election. I have constantly said that I Kujopoku is against part of the e-levy. The e-levy bill as proposed now, I have challenges with part of it. And I think that there should be more work done to make sure that everybody is comfortable with the bill so that we can all contribute towards it. You have the bill in each state which was passed where it double tax workers who have already paid their taxes and put their money on the electronic wallet to, to on the digital wallet to basically send it to people, friends and family or stuff like that. I have always said that there should be another technology or an IT architecture put in place to differentiate between merchants where you have to apply the VAT and NHIL and people who are just doing personal transactions. You cannot constantly be taxing people's savings, which in some cases you will be going into confiscation of um, savings. So it's unfortunate that um, it's been passed um, in a state that it's in. I think that we need a bill. Did, 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 you, just say, did you just say, Kodopoku, that it's unfortunate that it's been passed in the state in which it is? Yes, it's unfortunate it's been passed in the state because it's divisive. The state that it's in is divisive. I think that it should be passed in a state that both parties or both houses are happy with. Look, the opposition, the minority, are opposed to part of it. I'm sure in the past three months, they have um, made some utterances of maybe 1% rate, where they think that 1% rate, they would be happy to sit around the table. Um, there have been suggestions from some parts of the minority on some parts that they think that it double tax people who are sending money to friends and family. I, I also share that view. So, like, like I said, it's unfortunate that it's been passed in the state that it's in. Um, government needs the revenue. Let's not um, joke with that. Uh, we have all seen the state this economy is in. But the e-levy being passed at its state does not solve all our problems. If anything, is the beginning of most of our problems. Because now um, you have multi people who are going to stop using the service uh, because they don't think that they are prepared to pay 1.5% of that money they are sending. So your projections will not now pan out. Because your projections don't pan out, the e levy doesn't get to do what you claim is going to do. Then Ghanaians are going to look at you and say, Look, my brother, you said you're going to pass e levy and my road was going to be done. You're going to pass e levy, I'm going to be rich all of a sudden. You're going to pass e levy, and all contractors will be paid, which we all know is not true. So we've had problems which have been going on for five years. We've not put plans in place to solve them. And all of a sudden, we basically made it look like e levy is the, um, the magic one that solves all the problems. It's not. Uh, you, you just said that the passage of the e levy uh, into law, of course, uh, the president has to give us assent to it before it becomes law, is going to be the start of our problems. How problematic do you feel this is going to be for the telcos, especially in other countries, other jurisdictions? We've seen how this has been forced down the throat of people, so to speak, and they have lost a lot of those, you know, transacting electronically by about 50% and more in some countries. And these are countries right here in Africa. How do you foresee, if it, if it is maintained in this current form, it could affect telcos? Well, I, I don't share no tears for telcos. I think that in Ghana, regulatory is very poor. Um, and that's one of the conversations that me and you can have on one of our morning sessions. I think our telecom system has deteriorated. The telcos have stopped being telcos and become bankers. They are all interested in collecting mobile money uh, commissions, but not concentrating upgrading the system that they are licensed to operate. So I don't share tears for telcos. I think that MP uh, NCA is doing a very bad job in monitoring and making sure that our standard of communication in this country is high. Um, today, we don't even know what data, how they charge per megabyte or how they charge the data. You, you don't even know how they charge your phone call. Okay, we don't know how much we pay per second. All these things, they are just ripping us off. And for me, I don't share no tears for telcos. What government needs to do is to invest in an IT infrastructure. Look, like the Guta president, the, the Guta gentleman said, we need to tax e-commerce. Now, if you need to tax e-commerce, it doesn't mean that you go and tax e-levy, okay? 
e-commerce and e e levy are two different things. There is a lot of transaction that goes on which government is not in the right position to tax because we don't have the technology to do that. We, we've heard about GRA trying to now make sure that Amazon and Google and all these people that people buy stuff or pay their fair share with holding tax and all that. How are you going to do that? You don't have uh, the slightest technology in that sense. Okay, so what I have proposed, and I keep saying it, and as usual, nobody listens, is for us to develop an interface. Look, all it takes, government officials like to travel. They should go to India. India has a simple solution called UPI, Universal Payment Interface. There's a, uh, an artificial intelligence platform that all platforms, all other platforms sit on. So your mobile, the, your mobile money, which is electronic wallet, will sit on that platform all your e-commerce, e-switch, all those things will sit on that platform. Now, that will help you determine whether um, somebody is making a transaction to a merchant, somebody is making a transaction to an individual user, somebody is making a transaction to a service provider. That platform will help you distinguish between these people who are making these different type of transactions. Then you'll be able to now tax them accordingly. You cannot just come up and say that you are going to tax service providers when you don't have the infrastructure to do that. You are going to rely on the telcos to tell you what is um, a service provider because his, his mobile money is registered as such. So for me, I think that government should invest in that infrastructure, then be able to differentiate between different users and tax accordingly. All right. Finally, in about a minute, maximum a minute and a half, your expectations ahead of today's SONA. Well, look, um, SONA, as the name sounds, is state of the nation. Normally, when the president stands and speaks, um, he's always um, told us about achievements and things they've done. Whether it translates into a certain state in our country, he doesn't tell us that. Frankness and openness have always said that the president should have. The president believed that he was elected to fix the problems, not complain. But sometimes you should complain because if things that you are doing is not having the desired effect on Ghana, then you should tell us about it. What I expect from the president is to tell us if he is in touch with the people. We will know today. If the president come and tell us about roses and petals, rose petals and um, ice cream, then we know that he's not in touch with reality. So what we expect to hear from the president today is to hear from him if he really knows the state of the nation how people are going from day to day, how people are suffering, what he intends to do to address those suffering. That is the state of the nation. If he doesn't mention that and he goes and retreats some of the things he's done and the achievements and all those things, then that, that's not the state of the nation, unfortunately. Thank you so much, uh, Kojo Poku, for joining the conversation, and uh, we wish you the very best. Later, we shall reconnect after the state of the nation address. I have seen Senor Hossi, uh, in the background, uh, just to say a very good morning to you, Senor. Morning. All right, pleasure having you. Just hold for me. Let me wrap with Dr. Theo Echampong, uh, who is also uh, with us. Dr. Echampong, so you started talking about the economy. Let's broaden the conversation, talk about what you've seen on the back of exchange rates issues, on the back of fuel price hikes, on the back of the reforms that have been proposed. Uh, 30% of salaries of heads of SOEs going into a pool. We're not certain where exactly that will go. Uh, cuts when it comes to other people, uh, public uh, officers. I'm talking about the Council of State, among others. Uh, 15 peso reduction when it comes to uh, fuel prices and more. The policy rate being hiked up by 2.5 uh, percentage points, 250 uh, basis points. What is your quick take on that? And what would be your expectation ahead of today's SONA, purely from the economic standpoint? Um, so, yeah, like, like I did indicate um, earlier, the point really is, and, and everybody alludes to this, that we are, we are in difficult times, uh, economic difficulties. Even the finance minister um, says that to be the case in the statement that he read last um, Thursday. Um, and in that regard, we're seeing this impact on multiple channels on fuel price. We've seen inflation hitting almost 16% last month and probably may even go up much higher um, in the next month before uh, we start seeing some of the 
monetary policy interventions by the Bank of Ghana to hike up rates having a bit of an effect, you know, in trying to control um, inflation. We've seen the CD doing parogo on the on the forex ma market as well, and then we've seen <laughs> the CD doing um, what parogo. <laughs> yes, it's been dancing parogo on the forex market, um, and and then you know we've had revenue mobilization challenges uh, as as well, um, but. To be fair, what the government has attempted to do is try and address right, some of the issues, albeit, in my view, a little bit late um, in, in, at the end of the day, but still good um, in that sense. So, for example, some of the expenditure cuts that we have seen um, being announced already in January of this year, the government said that they were going to reduce expenditure by 20 percent. And how they're going to do this? is actually during, within the public financial management system, the allocations are made on a quarterly basis to the MDAs. So basically they are capping the allocations to these MDAs uh, by or reducing it by 20% every quarter. And then in the new statement that was announced by the finance minister just last week, they are going to add an additional 10% cut in what they call um, discretionary uh, expenditure or spending. And then you've got other things like the 30% cut to salaries, reduction in fuel coupons, banning travels, all of that. The important thing to state here is that the cumulative effect of all of these cuts is still going to keep the deficit at 7.4% of GDP. So in the 2022 budget that was read last November, the government had a target of 7.4% uh, deficit by the end of the year. Then we saw the Russia-Ukraine crisis and things began to uh, take a bit of a further hit. And so even with these new interventions on the expenditure side of the equation, it's still going to keep our deficit numbers at the same level as the, we had anticipated in the 2022 budget. What this tells you is that if these expenditure cuts hadn't been announced, then we would probably have been looking at a much, much bigger deficit, something probably in the region, in my estimation, of 9 to 10 percent by the end of this year, which then would not send a strong or a, a signal, a positive signal to the market. So what basically they are attempting to do is to rein in part of the expenditure, and then we've also got bits of the um, revenue side of, of the equation. But the smaller interventions to do with the fuel prices, um, things like that, I have said that it's fairly negligible. It amounts to only 2% of the total price cut of uh, petrol or diesel at the, at the pump. So in that sense, it, it doesn't really do much uh, by way for, for citizens. So what I expect in the state of the nation really um, is the president will talk a bit about the overall economy and, and public finances and some of the interventions that they're making to address or to improve um, domestic confidence in the economy, but also investor confidence in the economy. I expect them to, uh, the president to talk about some of the recent moves and interventions by the Bank of Ghana or the central bank to pump in two billion into the economy and whether that 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 would help um, reduce some of the hemorrhaging that we're seeing uh, on the forex market with uh, with the city but overall I think the important point which uh, Kujo was making also is the fact that we need to move away a bit from this fixation with macroeconomic growth and macroeconomic numbers to actually connect them to what is happening at the micro level, right? And this is where in previous state of the nation addresses, I have found it a little bit difficult because we tend to be fixated on the big macro numbers without actually connecting them to how this is improving or showing at least the president um, giving us some metrics on how this is improving productivity at the grassroots and translating into uh, into into outcomes, you know, uh, as as well. But yeah, the, those those are really the the core issues. I would um, expect the president to address. I don't expect any new policy announcements because uh, 
whatever interventions they're going to be making to safeguard the economy, I think has actually come out already from the finance minister's uh, press briefing of, of last week. So the president will perhaps really reiterate uh, right. a couple of these um, interventions. Dr. Champo, thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us. We'll, we'll confer with you again after uh, the soda. Dr. Theo Champo is no an No problem. Economist. Thank you very much and good morning to my good friend, Senya. Right, right. Uh, uh, thank you for I'm holding. Yeah. Right, Senya. Uh, just hold for me. Let me acknowledge uh, that we have on the phone lines President of Imani Africa, Franklin Kujo. Uh, Mr. Kujo, a very good morning to you. I, I, I think I hear you speaking, but it's very faint. I can barely hear you. Okay, I'm actually trying to shout here. Um, good morning, how are you? <laughs> uh, I'm very well. I hope you are too. Certainly could be better, but we are grateful for life. We thank God. I'll be finding out shortly what exactly could be better. I know you'll be talking about the economy as well, uh, but just bear with me, uh, ho hold briefly as I engage Senor uh, Jose, uh, who is CEO of the Chamber of bulk oil distributors. Uh, Senor, welcome aboard once more. Uh, let, let's talk about the rising cost of fuel and the 15 peso uh, reduction. I've heard some members of you know, the, the, the space you operate in say that they are expecting that up to about one city will be shaved off uh, the prices. Is, is that something you subscribe to, something you are leaning towards eventually? I think I granted you uh, your network, uh, an interview last week, and I indicated that there were efforts by government to try and uh, help BDCs access forward um, rates from the Bank of Ghana and through some other interventions that can help suppress uh, the price of the troll. And maybe cumulatively, we may be seeing an effect of between 50 and percent in the city. But it's just, again, strictly dependent on what those outcomes would be. Um, there's going to be an auction. Government is taking some steps today to try and uh, support the oil sector. And I'm very grateful to the Central Bank Governor and the Minister of Energy for their interventions in this particular regard. Um, the outcome of the auctions would also influence or define the extent to which that reduction can be uh, realized. On the world market side, uh, the net effect of the prices have, have been almost zero. Prices are not materially. Um, reduced um, on an average basis for the previous window and uh, the window we find ourselves in today. So uh, we need to be a bit more flexible um, about that. Uh, let's see how the day ends and, and hopefully we should be able to find something a lot more concrete to discuss come tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening towards the 1st of uh, April. Right. Uh, we know that the Russo-Ukrainian crisis is still on, but th there have been some positive lights they've met. Uh, there have been meetings in Turkey, and it appears things might not be as bad moving forward as we expect. Uh, so, so looking at this turn of, of events and, and what you are talking about, how much more do you feel your chamber can do in terms of the rising cost of Fuel. What, what more do you think you can do uh, after today's SONA to ensure that some of these things you are talking about will actually see the light of day? Well, we've done a lot and uh, we continue to engage government to find ways to improve the situation and minimize the, uh, both government's fiscal and also the, the consumers and actual prices at the same time. Um, we consistently advise, we run the policy analysis for government. And the BDCs today and their yeah, relative margins have been more than half. Just so we all know, BDCs are not making money in these times. Everybody's trying to give up something to get all of us going. Uh, we live in this country, we are Ghanaians, and the success and the sustainability of our country will also define the sustainability of our own selves. Coming up with all the solutions to help government the FX and all that. There are also solutions that are originated from us uh, as a chamber to help all of us get to solve the problem that um, is before us. Um, as new opportunities evolve, we will be leveraging that. And the bigger thing that we have to be thinking about is sustaining supply. You realize that in some of our West African countries, we are seeing shortages. Um, and uh, we definitely need to, uh, 
we really we definitely need to uh, get a, a supply situation under proper proper control um, right here in Gag. We've not seen short things. So that's been what's been the primary focus of government. And also as an advisor to the minister, I would definitely be advising him that that should be the ultimate goal. And I'm happy to announce here that I mean steps have been taken led by um, Honorable Matthew uh, Boku Prempe, popularly known as uh, Napo, um, to, to address this situation. Yesterday, he met with all the business leaders of the of, of BDCs at the chamber, together with the MPA, for us to map up a strategy to ensure we do not face any kind of supply challenges or the shortages that we see around. And concrete steps are being taken to really address that. Come April 22nd, that's when the Russian ban import the American ban of Russian imports will really be in full effect. So naturally there would have been a risk, a, a heightened risk coming, but Honorable Matthew Pempe together with the chamber and the NP have taken steps um, that are, are designed to, to avert any, any, any such crisis. So we will continue working to make sure the state of the nation on the petroleum side is sound and, and, and stable. One of the things I'm hoping to hear from the president today, really, is a proper conversation about the extent of political polarization in our country. We are worried as business people, we are worried as, uh, as citizens. The adversarial politics is, is, uh, is somewhat getting out of hand. The lack of consensus building and cooperation and the depolarization, not just at the echelon of politics, but even at the grassroots of politics, is more frightening than ever before. And I want to see the president take steps to reconcile this nation, to get this nation to cooperate and coordinate more towards a common goal for our mutual development. Uh, that, that must mean, very briefly, that must mean you feel there's too much polarization, right? It's excessive and it's threatening. And I think that we should quickly take steps to address that. And to be good to have the president in his tone and his speak leading that charge, okay. calling for unity, calling for cooperation, Right. And um, I, I hope to hear that from the president today. Senor, thank you so much for joining the conversation, uh, like I've done Pleasure with the others. Man. Hopefully we'll interact again after the sooner and you can share your thoughts. Have a good day. That is Senor Jose, uh, CEO of Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. Let me quickly bring in Imani Africa's president, Franklin Kujo. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kujo, for patiently waiting. Let's start from the, the angle of the e-levy. Yesterday it was passed, or was it? Mm. The court will determine. Uh, but, but what is your take on the e-levy? Yes, I know some of the things you've said in the past, but with what happened yesterday in Parliament, what do you think this is going to bring as far as the e-levy is concerned and as far as consensus building in our legislative house is also concerned? Well, thank you very much. I was hoping that the, uh, I mean, this passage or otherwise would have had the uh, be playing a role. Uh, unfortunately, it looks as if they were they were ambushed, as they say. And then, uh, unfortunately, the turnout was that the majority side passed it. Um, this goes to increase, or if you like, uh, make it more difficult to have political conversations about just anything that matters in this country. So the e levy situation. Uh, I'm afraid, rather excessive. It already tends political relations that we have in the country, and you do not want to see that really in a country that already people are. Uh, everybody is complaining about the hardship in the economy. The last you want, or the last of the things you want, is to have this hydra-headed problem of having political actors not talking or speaking to each other. On very important economic matters like the like it, like the left, so I was quite disappointed at, at, at what happened yesterday, um, and I'm thinking that beyond the adversarial approach of going to court and counter court uh, action, um, the president may have to call for a truce, and I think calling for a truce also means that there must be some renegotiation about the rates of the e -lip. I right. still hold the view. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm listening. I still hold the view that um, it, it attacks, that e levy is a tax that indeed uh, sounds and looks democratic. 
Uh, but the timing of it and the rate, and again, uh, must be looked at in order to ensure that uh, the already bed in Ghanaian is not, is not further exposed. So that's my view on the e -list. That's okay, so, so very, very quickly, uh, before you give us your expectations uh, ahead of today's SONA, uh, you say you were disappointed and the e-levy, uh, the rate, some have spoken about how affordable it could be. What would be affordable? What do you think would be affordable for the ordinary Ghanaian? Not 1.5%? Well, I mean, beyond the questions about affordability, it's also about the, the nature of the tax. I mean, I think that it, has, it should have been progressive, given what had happened in other countries when... Uh, it has been introduced as well. You know, right. uh, even for as low as 0.5 percent, mm -hmm. I think in was it Uganda? Uganda was one percent, brought to 0.5 percent. Uh, there was still a lot of uh, there was still a lot of turmoil. Uh, even in Ivory Coast, I'm sure you know that the rate wasn't as high as that of Ghana. Um, there was some challenge. So I thought that progressively it should be between 0.75. Percent, at least a max of 0.57 percent at the start. Then you gauge and see if really it is going to be something that people would accept. But don't forget, there's, we had a similar scenario with the communication service tax. Right. When it was high to about 9 percent, um, there was a dip in the total revenues that were collected. But when it was reduced again to, I think, 6 percent, we saw some incremental uh, changes in terms of the turn and the turnover. So I definitely wanted a rate that was lower than 1%. Right. Uh, you, you, your final thoughts then, expectations in just about a minute, a minute and a half. What are you looking forward to, to hearing from the president as, as he delivers the sonar today? Well, I think a lot has been said by your other co uh, panel that panelists as well. And I think for me, at this juncture, what stands out are two things. I mean, the economy what is being done about the economy, as well as the political polarization senior referred to right now. On the economy as a whole, we were expecting to see some deeper cuts in terms of the flagship project. We didn't hear that with the finance minister. I do not want to believe that the president would, uh, would announce further measures that would expect that he's going to probably insist on ensuring fiscal prudence and his administration, um, that would be welcome if you hear it again and you hear it better. Um, I'm not sure it's going to make any new announcements beyond what the finance minister did. Um, I, I, I didn't, didn't quite catch that. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're saying you're, you don't think... I'm not sure it's going to announce any expenditure rationalization as in reviews again or deeper cuts beyond what the finance minister did. Okay. Uh, uh, if there's anything at all, he's going to insist that he's going to be prudent. His government is going to be prudent fiscally. Um, I would have wished that he did. Uh, there were the cuts were much deeper, uh, but I'm not sure we're going to hear anything like that. And I think the other big ticket issue would be the polarization. There's just too much tension in the country, mm. and if we add that to the already tense, already uh, difficult economic situation. It doesn't look good at all. And he's the only person who can help diffuse the thing. Right. Mr. Kujo, I know how busy your mornings are. Thank you so much that you made the time all the same to interact with us. We're grateful. It's a pleasure. All right. Thank you uh, very much. Well, let's cross over to Parliament now, uh, where all the rockers happened yesterday. It's an anticipation of the State of the Nation address. My colleague, Parkwisi Parker Wilson is standing by. Uh, Parkwisi, if you can hear me, what is the ambience? What is uh, Parliament uh, looking like this morning? What are the expectations? So we'll try to uh, connect with Parkwisi Parker Wilson, who right. Is... So uh... go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we are currently in Parliament, getting ready for the all-important State of the Nation address by the President of the Republic. Of course, uh, Parliament standing orders are clear. Order 58 gives uh, the President, of course, and Article 62 as well, uh, gives the President the legal backing uh, to come to Parliament to deliver a message on the State of the Nation. And today, 
a number of individuals, the, those who've been invited are seated here. I must say that all is set. If you look at the preparation, all is set for uh, today's uh, State of the Nation address. And in Parliament, there is heavy uh, security presence drawn from the Ghana Police Service, the military, the Navy, and the Ghana. Uh, National Fire Service as well. Uh, to my right is the Ghana Police Band. Uh, they are here also getting themselves ready. Members of Parliament are not yet in the chamber. Well, according to the communication by the Speaker of Parliament, they are expected to be in the chamber at 9 a.m. exactly. But of course, they are not here. The only important agenda for today, Parliament, after going through the vote and proceedings, would only only give the president uh, the permission to deliver the state on uh, the, na the nation. So that is what we'll be doing for today. And I see some um, MPP uh, officials here. Uh, the former mayor for Tamale, uh, Musa Superior, is here. And uh, in fact, he's the only known NPP person here at the moment. And there are other dignitaries who've been invited for my, uh, some from the some from the um, the ECOWAS Parliament, I'm told, and, and, and a few others are here. Uh, let me just engage uh, Musa Superior briefly on, 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 on what's going to happen today. Of course, his expectations uh, briefly. Sir, uh, thank you very much for your time. You're live on Joy News. Uh, I, I want to find out from you, what are your expectations for uh, today's Citizen Nation address, sir? Well, I mean, we, we expect the usual thing to happen. The president is going to be here, and he's going to be here in a very, very, very hearty mood to inform the country, the state of our nation. So you can see that everybody is here and we are waiting patiently for the arrival of the president and his vice president and the rest of the leadership of parliament so that we, the nation can get an information about what has been happening to our country in the last one year. Are you expecting to hear something positive because the minority has already indicated that there's nothing good about the country at the moment? Oh, they have always said that anyway. I mean, look at what happened yesterday. They got everything wrong. You know, their strategy was a very confused one, and therefore the e-levy was passed. Now they are all over the place making all kinds of mess. I mean, approbating and reapprobating, you know, when the Supreme Court said that, uh, you know, first deputy speakers, when they are in the chair, they can vote, they were against it. Today they are using the Supreme Court to support their argument. That is totally un unacceptable. But as we said, the country has gone through a lot of challenges and nobody can 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 sweep that under the carpet because the the, the world health organization declared the world a global pandemic in 2020 and that was the time akufuado's government second term was ushered in and therefore there were a lot of challenges a lot of little bit of problems with the economy. So it has to be very candid and fair to the people of this country uh, when he delivers the message? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, he has been a candid person. He's a very strong lawyer, very humble, honest person. So whatever he says, I am going to, I'm confident that it is going to be the facts of the matter. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tifri is also uh, aspiring to contest the general secretary of the general secretary position of the uh, NPP. In fact, I just saw Isaac Osei, uh, the former Subin MP, also in the chamber. So, um, in terms of the minority, in fact, uh, uh, Ben, we have been told that uh, the usual heckling will happen, I mean, on, on the back of what happened uh, yesterday. Some of the minority members are quite upset, and uh, today, Sona. Uh, they, they, they have indicated or have said notice that they will ensure that everything that the president said they will subject it to a thorough scrutiny. Of course, the majority side are quite enthused and excited about uh, today's SONA basically because they believe that uh, yesterday the ELEV was approved, the Black Stars also made their way to Qatar, uh, being the World Cup. And so there is everything good for us to celebrate. And today, the president, uh, on the back of the uh, economy, the raft of measures uh, to ease the, the burden on the Ghanaian, Ghanaian people, uh, he's going to uh, deliver a very juicy and a positive uh, state of the nation address to the people of, 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 of the Zaz, I mean, a parliament. So all is set. Uh, the president's seat is ready. The speaker is ready. Um, members of parliament are not yet. In, in fact, I'm told that uh, they're having a cost meeting. Security present. In fact, I must say that if you come in, uh, the security is, is, is tight. Uh, they are scanning every individual who gets into uh, the chamber, whether it be in the public gallery here or even in the chamber. So 
uh, if you come to the president of parliament, and uh, and policemen and military men are stationed at every corner uh, here in parliament. So we are waiting for the president to arrive somewhere 9:30, and uh, after that, the, 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 I mean, uh, at 10 o'clock, he will deliver the state of the nation. But the MPs are expected to say that 9 9:15, so that they cannot begin their proceedings and await the arrival of the president of the republic. By chair, bringing us the scoop from parliament. Uh, the president hopefully arriving at around half past nine and at 10, hopefully we'll be hearing uh, from him. We'll take a break, but before that, uh, let me just sneak in this bit. Today's your day, wishing you a day, week, month, and the year of endless possibilities and infinite happiness. Here's to all the moments yet to come. Happy birthday, Sarah Ajasu of Zoom Lion Domestic from your husband, Paul Ajasu, and children, Clenum and Asay. Happy birthday to you. Uh, Mrs. Ajasu. We take a breather when we return. We'll bring you more on the State of the Nation Address. Stay. <laughs>